Change, a word with an endless stream of connotations and implications. While change is always temporary, change is inevitable for everything. To achieve a sense of structure and order, we collectively build society, civilization, and systems of law. This is our way of combating the chaos of change, creating a system for the mass population to abide by in order to ensure a good quality of life for all. A life where those who are pro-social and hardworking will get the most out of it, but those who are lazy and exhibit antisocial behaviors will not. I don't want to get malnourished either. Do you look like you're malnourished? As they will be penalized or ostracized by society at large. When this dynamic is unbalanced and those hardworking masses feel oppressed or even cheated, it might lead to a revolution. In the case of politics, a revolution is when a radical change needs to be made by the masses if they feel oppressed by their overlords. Acknowledge me as emperor! It's an attempt to overthrow a current political regime, usually due to some kind of negligence or corruption. In the People Power Revolution in 1986 in the Philippines, an authoritarian government led by President Fernand Marcos was overthrown to pave the way for democratic system under Corazon Aquino, a time for more peace and prosperity. The success was marked by non-violent demonstrations across a 20-year period, it took two decades to overthrow corruption. Depending on who you ask, it's either a long stretch of time or a very short stretch of time. In fact, most revolutions tend to fail, especially in Tsarist Russia, most violent being Bloody Sunday in 1905. This is a petition we're going to give to the Tsar. You're calling my plonker now, aren't you? <laughs> the point is, in pursuit of change, massive tolls must be taken, usually with human life. The cruelest part of change is that change isn't always the way that we envisioned it to be in the first place. People will pay extremely high costs to achieve that outcome. That is the nature of war and the nature of change, the product of which being revolution. Everyone has their own morality and acts upon so, and acts upon what they deem to be just, which is why it can never be black and white. The color of morality is always shaped by the observer's perspective. Attack on Titan is a story which presents this concept masterfully by focusing on the main character of Eren and keeping him the same but slowly shifting the world around him, and simultaneously us, the viewers. This gives a kind of cognitive dissonance and being split on who to root for because of this. The only show to do something like this of this magnitude before was Code Geass, in which the protagonist Lelouch v Britannia is the one to seemingly change with the world around him being the same. The point is both these characters exist as forces of change in the stories that they inhabit, whereby focusing on challenging the status quo through any means necessary. Interestingly, despite the pair committing heinous crimes in the name of change and justice, they have a great support in the anime fanbase. These characters seemingly went from a place of powerlessness and oppression to having all the power in the world. So let's look at how this came to be by comparing the two characters of Eren Yeager and Lelouch v Britannia by looking at the philosophy of change and revolution. As with most stories, it begins with the protagonist's goal and reason for it. In Code Geass, Lelouch is motivated to build a world where his younger, crippled sister can live happily in. Later, Lelouch's ambition expands to wanting change for the whole world for the sake of those who are oppressed. The Britannian Empire was founded on a notion that the strong will must overcome the weak, a Darwinist point of view. Consequently, natives of colonized nations were rendered subhuman and subjected to ghettos. Lelouch didn't just want to change the world because it was the right thing to do, he felt dead inside and by the prospect of not being able to change anything and live in a lie. Watching Britannia take over Japan, his mother killed and his sister crippled by the trauma of that event was all the motivation he needed to embark on a lonely path of change. Show me your motivation. Only upon receiving his gias, his power, was he finally able to set the wheels in motion. With Eren, his origins are similar. Cursed with living in a world trapped behind walls with monsters living outside powerless to do anything to stop them. Here, Eren and his people are directly oppressed and live in a constant state of fear. Only those brave enough to venture outside were able to learn more, though fatalities were very high. From this, Eren was driven to reach freedom, a place where he could see the world without the threat of titans. For him, all of this reached a boiling point when the titans breached the wall, and one coming in led to his mother being eaten by one of the titans. Forced to helplessly observe from the sidelines, Eren gained first-hand experience on what true despair was, a despair he believed to be due to his lack of power. Whoever the Titans were, wherever they came from, Eren was determined to eradicate all of them in the hopes of being free from this fear 
and get this revenge for all the pain that they had caused. Upon realizing he could become a titan himself, only did the tide start to change and allow him to impose his will. Both characters come from a place of lacking power and witnessed firsthand the devastating consequences of lacking it. They both refused to accept the existences forced upon them and their trauma acted as a guiding light which catalyzed upon them receiving that power. Lelouch though, his quality of life was average and mediocre, living as a disguised prince in the high society of Britannia. His life wasn't that stressful, but the fear of him and his sister being used for political bargaining tools loomed over him. For Eren, he had the chance of living a normal life within the walls. Even if the wall wasn't breached in episode 1, his explosive desire to see the world and be free was enough to motivate him to move forward. These characters believe that they and those around them deserve better, so they fought for it. An important question to ask when analysing characters for themes of change is, what is their position in the world? What is the character's relationship to the wider world? How far do said characters need to go in order to achieve the ends that they seek? Due to Lelouch's seemingly average social status, since he's incognito, I mean. he continues to play the role of being a student by day and lead the Black Knight Crusade by night. Living a normal life, he will lower the chance of arousing suspicion, while having the heads up on what his adversary, Suzaku, might do. One could argue that Lelouch's goal would be impossible if not for his double life. If he disappeared while Zero appeared, someone would definitely have pieced it together. Wait. I know you. That's no mistake. You're a wanted man. It's you think so? Me. Let me make this easy for you all to understand. Acknowledge me as Emperor! Lelouch had many close calls, like with Villette. Nature of a double life implies a base level of deception, all but which C2 was affected by, hence affecting all of his relationships. How can he have any emotional intimacy with all the lies acting as walls between him and other people? Kias was referenced as a power that leads users through a journey of solitude. To the Black Knights, Lelouch rather, Zero is viewed as a symbol of revolution and the one whom they risk their hopes in. To his fellow students, he is a lazy but intelligent member of their friendship group. In order to conduct his plans of revolution and change, Lelouch is whomever he needs to be into his circles in the world. However, this didn't persist throughout the whole of Kogias. Specifically, two major events come to mind. The first was when tragedy struck upon Lelouch accidentally using Gias on Euphemia, leading to the bloody massacre of crowds of Japanese people. We all remember this, but I think some of us forget that he almost agreed to it. And agreed to this plan of making a special zone. In essence, slowly building up what people used to know as Japanese culture. It would have been a place of peace and prosperity in theory, yet we never knew how the rest of the world would have reacted. Based on the ruthless style of Britannia, it might have been only a temporary solution. As it contradicts the totalitarian approach of the empire, Lelouch learned a lot that day. No concessions could be made, and his goal had to be absolute as absolute as the empire that he was fighting. The second was when Lelouch's Gias power was revealed to his army, resulting in their mutiny. He gives up just to be saved by Rolo, further reinforcing his role and what he needed to do. I believe at this point in the story, Lelouch was ready to become the enemy of the world. If he was able to be seen as this monster by his sister, then I guess the whole world would have followed. Even though it was a difficult road, he had to lie to the entire world in order to change it. With Eren, his role was seemingly ambiguous for most of the story. He begins as just another downtrodden member of society, wishing for a life of freedom. After transforming into a titan himself, his level of agency increases and subsequently his impact on the world, like the scout's effort for freedom. However, as we learn Eren ha actually has access to the founding titan, he lives in both the past and the future, as trippy as that sounds. It made him essentially a god of the world, able to travel in time and directly affect outcomes in the story. Think Bill Murray's Groundhog Day and the butterfly effect. Eren had a lot more than just a role in the story, he was the story. It wasn't a case of Eren versus Wild, it was a case of Eren versus himself. By this I mean his crippling mental state following his contact with Historia. It was later revealed he did a lot of horrible things to achieve his final result. As long as he met with Zeke, nothing could have stopped him. I mean, Eren smiled maybe twice in that point in the story. The final contrast between Eren and Lush is control with Lelouch's relatively lacking compared to Eren's. A lot of his success hinged on his self-belief and his conviction. When Lelouch was faced with large obstacles in his plan, he was able to adapt and overcome them with his intellect and clear mind. Eren's obstacles were internal, cursed with knowledge and doomed in isolation. His role in the narrative was fighting his own desire for the sake of change. Lelouch did this too, but on a different scale. Both made huge sacrifices. Two quotes pop out to me when analysing these shows in relation to sacrifice. The first was when Armin said, those who can't sacrifice anything can't change anything. And when Lelouch said, you can't change the world without getting your hands dirty. 
These quotes highlight the necessity of exchange in order to achieve change, as is the main theme of Faultmail Alchemist Brotherhood of the theory of equivalent exchange. The distinctive factor is one's awareness of this fact and how that awareness is present in their behavior. Belush is a shining example of this action. He knows that he must cast his own conscience aside in order to play the role of the victim and subsequently witness the betrayed eyes of all of his loved ones to achieve peace. For better or for worse, Lelouch knew that he would have to embark on the path of blood to get anywhere with his plans. Lelouch sacrificed his love, his relationships, his family, and ultimately his own life in order to have all the world's hatred channeled upon him. For Eren and Attack on Titan, the whole thing is based on sacrifice. In every season, people die, either from Titans or from one another. In the beginning, the scouts would willingly risk their lives in order to venture to the outside world just for a shred of understanding. Obviously, those that underwent those missions knew what they were signing up for, but did Eren? He was referenced by John as a suicidal maniac and for good reason. He would charge recklessly into battle without really considering the risks. He was just obsessed with killing them all. How aware was he of the sacrifices that he needed to make in order to make his goals a reality? Did his awareness expand upon becoming the Attack Titan to then having the Founder's power? Eren sacrificed a lot of people in order to reset the world. Mass genocide, in fact. Eren pointed out that there was no other way to get this outcome. So much so that he had let his own mother get eaten in the process, a very real sacrifice that he was aware of. Only that he had to become cold and emotionally cut off from the people he loved the most, being Armin and Mikasa. Not to mention play the role of the most hated man in the world, very similar to Lelouch. I would say that the key difference in the two characters was their perspective. Since Eren and Lelouch were vastly different in their strategies, Lelouch had a rough plan in his mind, but needed to adapt to the circumstances around him, like things he didn't anticipate, like the Gears evolving and the Black Knights turning on him. His sacrifices came one after the other, and having C2 as his confidant kinda helped him through it a little bit. Eren had no confidant. Maybe he could speak with Ymir from time to time, but for all intents and purposes, he was alone. Not only that, but his powers came to him from an incomprehensible point of view. He simultaneously inherited the memories and ancestors of his past and the future, meaning that his perception of time is in his own league and just completely independent of others. Type of solitude which Lelouch couldn't even begin to understand. It's hard to say who sacrificed more, but due to this fact, I would say that Eren had to experience a lot more pain in order to achieve his goals. At face value, Lelouch and Eren couldn't be more different. Lelouch is reserved, calm and intelligent. Eren is loud, impulsive and headstrong. These characters are polar opposites, yet they are both mass murderers and revolutionaries. This fact adds weight to the disassociative element involved in both their paths to change. Despite their character differences, they had to cast aside who they were in order to be the monster they believed the world needed them to be. With this in mind, they were husks of their former selves and acted solely as vessels for change. I'd say they were more like forces of nature, like a hurricane or a tsunami, than an actual person. However, while one character embodied this metaphor, the other simply wore it as a mask until his death. You see, the key difference between our characters is that Lelouch was able to act out this facade until his very last moment, and he just kept what made him human in the end. Lying there at death's door, Nunnally, Lelouch's original reason for carrying out all this madness, witnessed all he had to go through bear the weight of this mask. Eren was killed by the woman he cared most about. Mikasa also learned Eren's intentions, yet inherited a world empty and barren. Both fought for the greater good. Lelouch actually left something behind for his loved ones. And ultimately, in Eren's final conversation with Armin, the villain mask slips off, revealing the scared, desperate young boy inside. At the time that the final seasons of Attack on Titan were aired, I was kind of worried. I was afraid of the path that Eren was going down, and I was afraid that it was going to copy Code Geass. I mean, the whole world uniting against the MC who becomes evil to create world peace. Was I disappointed? Well, not really. Yeah, it ended up following the same format, but in essence it was quite different. I feel like Attack on Titan did its own thing. Let me explain. We all know that Lelouch at some point, maybe after the Black Knight's betrayal, decided to fully embrace being everybody's enemy. Once he achieved that, he planned his own demise by his best friend in order for him to bear the rest of the burden. Pretty simple stuff, relatively speaking. In Attack on Titan, Eren doesn't really act like the villain, he just kind of is, and just kind of make, tries to make his own peace, I suppose? The key contrast is that for a large portion of the story, Eren is motivated by his own revenge and freedom. Upon realizing that the two are intertwined, he goes full throttle to achieve his plan of the rumbling to commit genocide and wipe out the whole planet, everyone that wasn't related to him. Here's the interesting part. When confronted with all he did, Eren just says, I don't know. What? That was a very nihilist spin, don't you think? With us bearing witness to the cycles of war, which continued after the events of the show, Eren just supported his own team and just kind of peaced out. Lelouch at least tried to minimize some of the bloodshed. We know that Zero Requiem created indefinite peace. Probably not. As we know from the Ragnarok connection that 
his father Charles imposed, what's the point of peace if there's no such thing as tomorrow? And despite their differences, both characters believe that fighting for a better tomorrow was worth it. Through fighting for evolution and change. I've been Sir Lance, and have a great day.